This is our final evening of grace, and uh, this is the, we're going to talk about how to have revival in America. We all pray for it. And we think if we fast long enough, don't eat trans fats, don't smoke or drink or cuss, or hang out with people who do, because it'll hurt your witness. If we, if we do it all right and really plead with God, he'll bring revival to America. That's not how it's going to happen. <laughs> Uh, it's just not. In fact, just the opposite is going to happen. The thing that will bring revival to our nation is when we love each other. And we're a bunch of porcupines. <laughs> it's hard. I used to say to my church, there's nothing wrong with my church I can't fix with a few funerals. And, uh, and we, 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 it's hard for us to love each other because we're a part of a club that only accepts screwed up people. And you get a bunch like that together and and it's hard to love one another. But the gift of grace is the gift of love and intimacy with others. And, uh, and you're looking at a guy who knows because that's very, very hard for me. Uh, Michael Kelly Blanchard is a friend of mine, one of the finest lyricists in America, Peter, Paul, and Mary uh, did some of his material. He's the one who wrote, uh, Be ye glad, be ye glad. Every debt that you ever had is paid up in full. Be ye glad, be ye glad. But he, he writes stories, and they're wonderful stories. And uh, he sings songs. He's an Anglican brother, and I sometimes have him speak to my students at the seminary. And uh, he has this story about a girl whose parents were in an automobile accident. And her mother was killed, and the father, I guess she was a late adolescent. And her father, I guess because of the guilt or whatever, uh, there was a lot of hostility between the father and the daughter. And they would fight, and uh, the police would be called. And eventually, he kicked her out of the house, and she went to live with her grandmother. And she was a party girl. Uh, she had gotten pregnant, had had an abortion. She was pregnant again. She... Uh, she did a lot of bad stuff, and the song is about her, and it's about the room where she lived in her grandmother's house, and there was a picture of Jesus on the wall in that room, and the chorus of the song, as Michael tells the story, is this, and there's, and, and by the way, she works at the local factory, and there's a guy with a big black Bible, and he tells her that God's going to judge her, and she knows she deserves it. She knows that God's not happy with her. But back at the grandmother's house, there's this picture of Jesus, and this is the chorus. And there's a picture of Jesus hanging on the wall, and it's been there since I was very small. And he looks like he just seen a little girl fall, and he don't look angry at all. He don't look angry at all. That's the message. If you've been listening during the teaching, I've given you a lot of principles and a lot of biblical exegesis and a lot of doctrine, but it comes down to one statement, and that is that if you belong to Jesus, he's not angry at you, and he will never be angry at you again. When I discovered that, that was wonderful because I was accepted. I was acceptable before God, and that was so cool. But there's more than that. It is the key to the worship wars. It is the key to division among Christians. It is the key to the way we demonize one another. Tony Campolo and I did a television show for a year out of New York called Hashing It Out. We did it, neither one of us had time. And we did it for one reason. Now, by the way, I don't agree with Tony about anything except Jesus. He's my pinko commie friend, and he calls me his right-wing, reactionary, conservative friend. And we've loved each other for 30 years. And so the set was in a diner, and it's two old guys who disagree on everything, and it was called hashing it out. And the reason we did it wasn't because we needed more exposure. It wasn't because the reason we did it is because we noticed how Christians hate each other. I mean, if you speak in tongues and I don't, you're going to hell. And, 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 and then we got to be right, and we got to... And, and so Tony and I decided there were probably not two people in the world that could demonstrate it more. 
because we do disagree on about everything, but we love each other. And so we decided on that program to demonstrate how you can profoundly disagree with somebody and at the same time love each other. And the interesting thing was, and that was on the Odyssey Network, everywhere I went around the country, people would come to me and say, hey, I saw that television program with you and Ken Polo said, you guys really love each other, don't you? And we, and we really do. You know why? It's because of grace. It's because of what I want to teach you. And I want you to listen very carefully because I'm an expert. All my life, and I mentioned this the last evening, all my life I felt on the outside. If you're an adult child of an alcoholic, you know what I'm talking about. The uh, psychology professor in our counseling department at the seminary has a cartoon in his office, and it shows uh, uh, this gigantic uh, auditorium. And there's one person sitting on the front row, and if you look close, way back in the corner of this big auditorium, there's one other person. And the caption at the bottom says, the annual convention of children of normal parents. <laughs> so everybody has their stuff. But, but I always felt unacceptable. I have people call me Dr. Brown, and you should, but I'm not even a nurse. I work with people with PhDs from Cambridge and Harvard and Duke and Oxford. And there's me. I ran away from kindergarten. Uh, but I do have doctorates, and, and I got them in a half an hour. All I had to do was to speak at graduation ceremonies at a college or a university, and they make you a doctor. And you get better reservations at restaurants, and people are a lot nicer to you. But, but when I got my first doctorate, the board of this college I was speaking for, I wrote a letter. Because I used to make fun of it. I'd say, if you want to know whether somebody really loves Jesus and they're a doctor, call them Ms. or Mr. and see how they react. Well, I get this letter from the Board of Trustees, and they said, we have voted unanimously to give you a doctor of letters. But we don't want to publicly embarrass ourselves or you by offering it and have you turn it down. So will you accept it? And I prayed and fasted for about, oh, three seconds exactly, <laughs> and wrote back. I said, are you crazy? I was just a little boy on the outside of the house, and nobody would let me in. You give it to me. I'll accept it. It was kind of a metaphor for the way I've always lived. I've always pretended to be better than I was. I've always pretended to know more than I knew. I've always said, if they ever find out, I'm in serious trouble. So I wore this mask. And I, and I went around and I tried to get people to accept me. If you ever read C.S. Lewis, there's a little, a little book of four essays called The Weight of Glory. And the final essay in that little book of essays is called The Inner Circle or The Inner Ring. And it describes me. Somebody trying to get on the inside and nobody would let me. So if revival happens when we love each other and, and porcupines get together, uh, then it ain't going to ever happen to me because I just can't do that. Until I knew I was acceptable by God. Now, let me, uh, when I was in grammar school, uh, I was not a wonderful student. Uh, <clears throat> and we won't go into that, but I was kind of trouble looking for a place to happen. But we, when I was in grammar school, we had a principal who was as mean as a devil. I, and the way they kept us in line was to threaten to send us to the principal. And you didn't want to go to the principal. They said he had a paddle as big as the side of a barn, and he killed little kids. And, and I remember the teacher who had it with me, his name was Mr. Brown, said, you're going to the principal's office. I said, I promise, I'll be good. And she said, no, it's over. You're going to the principal's office. So she sends me down to the principal office. I'm thinking about if my little brother will enjoy riding my bicycle after I'm dead and stuff like that. And, and I go into the principal, shut the door, and I think, it's over. He's going to kill me. He said, what are you here for? And, and, he's, and I said, Mrs. Brown, uh, Mrs. Uh, Smith sent me. That's not her name. And he said, you don't like her much, do you? And I went, oh, shoot. I said, no, n not a lot. He said, I don't either. <laughs> And he said, but you know, I've got to do this. So every day at the end of school, I want you to come into my office. And uh, we'll talk. But I'll get you out in time to catch the bus so you can get home. And I couldn't tell anybody. I wanted to say, he's not what you think he is. He's a, he's a, 
He, he doesn't like Mrs. Smith either. He is, he never hit me. He never tried to kill me. We just sit and talk. He's a really, but I couldn't do that because it would have hurt his rep and would have hurt the whole discipline system of the entire school. But I wanted to tell people, I feel that way about God. They've been lying to us. They told us that God was this child abuser in the sky, and he's not. He really isn't. He likes me a lot. He's very fond of me. And you may not, but he's very fond of me. And that makes all of the difference because it is the gift of God. Let me read you some scripture. This is Galatians 5, 22, and then I'm going to read through the sixth verse of the sixth chapter of Galatians. And we're going to plow through some pretty condemning stuff. And if you're neurotic the way I am, when I get to the, the condemning stuff, you're going you're gonna to feel really bad. But stay with me, because God never gives bad news except to prepare the way for the good news. But the fruit, this is Galatians 5, 22 through 6, 6. Well, I'm not, I'm not even going to read the, the bad stuff. I'm going to start at the sixth verse. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And that's the teaching. And it's the teaching that we've looked at over all these sessions on the evening of grace. Now the practical application that the Apostle Paul gives when he gives us an illustration of what he's just been talking about. In other words, the first part was pedagogical. Now it's phenomenological. It's illustrative. It is, this is what I've been talking about. Brothers, parenthetically sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. One who is taught the word must share all good things with he who teaches. I, uh, I'm not a very uh, touchy person. I'm better. Uh, I, uh, I one time, we had a man die in our church who was the founder of the Dolphin magazine. He was a young guy. He was in his 30s. And I went to visit uh, his wife in the hospital, and she hugged me. And then after she hugged me, she started crying. And I thought, oh, my, what have I done? And she said, Steve, could I talk to you? Have I done something to offend you? And I said, no, I just don't hug good. I don't know how to do that. And that's not you. That's me. And it's just, I just, well, I was in, here in California. I'm from Florida, by the way, and we're doing this from California. And I was out here for a conference, and I was on this campus, and, and this woman came running across the campus and jumped into my arms. And I thought, lady, I never saw you. I don't know who you are. She said, I know. Eddie Waxer told me to do this. He said, you hated it. <laughs> and Eddie's one of the two guys I'm in accountable to for 25 years. And then two years later, I came back out here to California to go to that same conference. She came running across the campus, and she grabbed me. And then she pushed me back and she said, you're growing. She said you didn't wince as much as you did the last time. You know, she was right. That was a profound statement. As I could hug people, and I'm a hugger now and I wasn't, as I can touch people, as I can be honest with them, it's the gift that comes from God's grace. But we're so busy condemning each other. In Oak Ridge, uh, Tennessee, and I'm from the mountains of North Carolina, so far from there. That's where, they, that's where they decide how to blow people up and do atomic stuff. And uh, there were, that, that little Oak Ridge was a little tiny town. There was a church there. And so when they started putting all the new facilities, the government facilities at Oak Ridge, just piles of people started moving into Oak Ridge. And there was one church. And they all started going to this church. But when it came time for communion, they wouldn't let anybody 
take communion unless they've been baptized the way they were baptized, subscribe to the statement of faith the church had, that they had, did, uh, attended all of the meetings of their church and joined their church. And so the people who were not allowed to take communion just backed out, and pretty soon they started starting other churches. And there's some very exciting churches in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. But, but that church is not there anymore. You know what it's become? It's become a restaurant. And that's cool. It's called the Deacon's Bench. And they say they serve really good food. And where the altar used to be is now a bar. Now, I think that's better than that church. And that's an example of why revival only comes when Christians love each other. Okay, enough chit-chat about this. Let me show you. First, I want you to note from the verses that I read to you that grace provides a realistic assessment of human nature. Galatians 6, 1a, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression. And people are always saying to me, hey, I want to go back to and start a New Testament church. And I want to say, what are you, a fruitcake? They're worse than we are. All they did was fight. They were serial killers in the New Testament. Don't ever misunderstand. Barnabas was jealous of Paul, and Paul was jealous of Barnabas. They, the, the only reason we have deacons is because of a church fight. These are not wonderful people. The truth is this has always been a problem in the church. It was a problem in Galatians, and if you were listening for the first evening of grace, when I introduced the book of Galatians to you, and some of you weren't listening, and I know your name, if you were listening then you know that Paul is writing because of the division that's taking place in the book. A lot of the things that Paul writes, for instance, both First and Second Corinthians are made up of three different letters. And a lot of that deals with division and hatred and envy and strife and jealousy that takes place in the church. And so what Paul says, if anybody's caught in a bad situation, in other words, I'm recognizing a reality here. I'm recognizing the truth. There are two basic anthropological views about human beings. One is that people are basically good with a proclivity for evil. And the other is that people are basically evil with a proclivity for good. Now, your political philosophy, your educational philosophy, your theology, your metaphysics, all of that will take one of those two, two propositions. For instance, if you're statist, if you believe the state can do it better than the individual, then you believe in the goodness of human beings. But if you're anti-statist, you know the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things, that power corrupts, that it corrupts absolutely when you get a lot of it. And so the Bible realistically assesses that. There is nothing worse than Christians singing kumbaya to one another and holding hands and tiptoeing through the tulips, pretending that they're nice and the world is nice and the tulips smell good and Jesus loves us and God's in his heaven and all's right with the world. It's not. I hate to be the one to tell you about it, but it's not. It's a bad world and we're bad people. And, and the only reason we look better than others is that we know the rules and we can fake it better than they can. People always come to me and say, I know a pagan who's better than you Christians. Duh. Why do you think we're Christian? Because we're having real trouble with this goodness thing. If we weren't having any trouble with it, we'd do something else. And so there's a very realistic assessment of who we really are that's given by the Apostle Paul. If you're familiar with 1 Timothy, the Apostle Paul gives some standards that leadership in the church ought to have. And, and one of the things that he says is that a new Christian can't be a deacon or an elder in a church. And we've always thought, the scholars have thought, that Paul is talking about maturity, doctrinal knowledge, uh, kindness, wisdom that comes with age. That's not what he's talking about. Listen to me. If you like hot dogs, don't watch them being made. If you like the law, don't go to Washington and watch that being made. And if you love the church, don't watch that being made. Paul knew that if you took a new Christian and you put him in leadership, they'd see the truth and they'd become Buddhist. They would revert to something else. 
And so that's why Paul is talking about that sort of thing. And so the Bible is very realistic. And you can't have fellowship until you realistically assess who you are and who everybody else is. Um, Buddy Green travels with us often. I love Buddy Green. Uh, and I, he, I don't get anything for this, but if you want to if you want some fun music, he's getting well known in bluegrass circles. I mean, some of the big stars in bluegrass think he's the best thing since sliced bread. And he travels with us, and he does our Born Free seminar and our Steve's Front Porch, and and he's uh, in, and we do Grace for the Moment concerts, and I tell stories, and he plays songs. And Buddy was invited to go to Promise Keepers, and they wanted him to sing a song of commitment and obedience. And Buddy got out his guitar, and he was ready to sing. And then God told him he couldn't sing that. So he went to the leadership. And you don't do this at Promise Keepers. And he said, that's a lie. I can't sing this song. He said, that's not what these guys need. Uh, He said, we're not Promise Keepers. We're Promise Breakers. And so all the leadership got in a huddle, and they prayed. And God said, you know, Buddy's right. And so he sang a song of grace. I can't be your friend if we're both wearing masks and pretending to be something that we're not. It's just not going to happen. If I try to hide who I really am for you, we're never going to be friends. It's going to be superficial and shallow, and I'm going to feel on the outside, and you're going to feel on the outside. Paul says, don't do that. If somebody's caught, you who are spiritual, and that doesn't mean self-righteous. It means at this point you ain't committing that sin. You are spiritual report, but be careful because you're going to do exactly the same thing. I'll never forget the choir member who was gay and who fell. So I hated it. Everybody knew he was gay, but he was celibate, and he was the best tenor we had in our choir, and he fell. And he, and he didn't just fall a little bit. He was public. Everybody knew he'd fallen. He'd, he went back, and it was just awful. Our choir director, who is a who was at that time uh, and a very uptight, straight as an arrow, theological reform Calvinist, God bless him, <laughs> went to Jimmy and said, Jimmy, everybody knows you screwed it up, so you can't sing in the choir for a while. And Jimmy said, I know. He said, I want you to sit on the front row. He said, but I want you to know I'm going to sit with you. And uh and in two or three months, once everybody knows, you can sing again. And so this, this gay guy whom I loved, who had fallen, sat by the straightest, meanest Calvinist you've ever met. And the Calvinist had his arm around him in every worship service of the church. And I thought, we're doing church here. This is what this is all about. And the church bonded. And the church loved. And the church was a place where where prostitutes and sinners and wine bibbers could come and find cold water for a thirsty soul. Augustine said, the church is a whore, but she's my mother. Isn't that awful? I wouldn't say anything like that. That was Augustine, though. He's a church father, so I can quote him. I wouldn't say something like that, but it's true. And if you've been in a church very long, you know that. And you can't have, you can't be in the inside. We can't be intimate until I tell you who I really am, until you tell me who you really am, uh, who you really are. I, I'm unshockable. I've been doing this for, that's why I know you guys. I've been doing, I've heard more confessions than you can imagine. I mean, you just don't know. I. I know everybody's got secrets. I know you guys. And there's nothing you can say to Jesus that will shock him or cause him to reject you. But listen to me. There's nothing you can tell me that's going to cause me to ever reject you or think less of you. And until we start, there's a man by the name of Gerard who wrote a book called The Transparent Self. Now, it's not in print anymore. It used to be used in medical school and nursing schools. And I don't even know if he was a Christian, but he was a wise person. And he said, what you got to do is you got to trade off pieces of your soul with other people to see if they'll stomp on it. So I'll give you a little bit of my soul, and you give me a little bit of your soul, and we'll see how we handle it. And if I don't kill you with a little bit of the soul that you gave me, uh, you can give me more. And if you don't kill me, I'll give you more. And it's a process 
until pretty soon you take the mask off in front of another person and then intimacy really starts. We don't do much of that in the church. Uh, we wear masks. I wear a mask. I'm not preaching at you. I'm cynical. I really am. But I'm more cynical about me than I am about anybody else. And I pretend so much. I, I have a barber who died recently. And don't make jokes. I know I'm... Uh, but, you know, i got to have some of it cut occasionally. And I love going to this barber shop. And my barber was an outright pagan. He was, he's just awful. And, and he thinks his calling in life is to offend me. You know what's hard if you're a Christian and somebody tells you a dirty joke? It's, it's not that. It's when they're funny and you can't laugh. And, and you know you're going to hurt you. So he, he just loved doing that to me. But he loved me and I loved him. Then he got cancer. And I could tell you a whole story. The last time he was out, they brought him to the church where I was teaching. And it was a big church. And they rolled him back in a wheelchair. His girlfriend called him and said, Steve's going to preach. And he said, she said, you want to go to church? And he, he said, no, I'm not getting out of this bed. And she said, Steve's going to preach. And he said, oh, and he used some words. He said, come and get me, I'll go. And they rolled his wheelchair up in the front row. And he laughed at everything, every joke. And he, and he listened intently, but he didn't know Jesus. And then they took him from the church to the hospital. And I went to the hospital to be with my barber. And I said, Tom, we've laughed and joked. I used to tell him, you ought to run to Jesus. He likes people like you. And he'd say, no, you don't understand. I'm bad. And I said, he likes bad people. But I never could get through. And I said at the hospital, Tom, you're going to die. Uh, and I can't, we can't get around anymore. It's, it's really important that you know Jesus. And, and I told him. And, and uh, he received Christ. And I just, I just felt so good. He died shortly after that. Now, you've got to remember, his friends are not church people. They're kind of, they're real pagans, and I loved them. But they didn't know anybody religious, and they wanted to have a funeral, a memorial service for Tom, but they didn't know anybody like me. I was the only one they knew, so they said, would you do it? And I said, yeah. So we went down to the Banana River in Florida, and they had beer and pot, and they were down in partying, and they had this pavilion, and I showed up in a tie. And I thought, Lord, I didn't sign on for this. And uh, so, so I got up and I decided, well, shoot. Um, and I said, all right, we're going to talk about Tom. And I said, y'all tell me about Tom. Let's tell each other stories about Tom. And his grandson stood up and started crying. And he said, I love my granddaddy. He taught me how to fish. He threw me out of the boat, but I loved him anyway. And, and he taught me how to fish. And then he couldn't talk anymore. He started crying. And an old guy who's bald like me with a ponytail, an old aging hippie, came up and he had a beer in his hand. And he said, uh, let, me, let me tell you, let me tell you about my man, Tom. And he starts crying. And then another old hippie came up and put his arm around him and uh, held him and his beer till he got his act together and he could talk. There were girls dressed in bikinis. This is not like a memorial service in a church. <laughs> and I'm thinking, when they finish talking about Tom, I'm going to have to say something. So I got up. The first thing I said, I said, there are two things. One is obvious and one isn't. The most obvious thing is that I'm the best dressed person at this thing. Uh, and the second thing that you know, too, is that I'm the most religious person here. And I said, now, let me tell you the truth. I am so phony, I cannot stand myself. Sometimes I just want to go away and hide from people. I'm so phony. And, I, and let me tell you what I loved about Tom. He wasn't. And Tom's in heaven now. And he's in heaven because Jesus likes people like Tom and people like me. And he'll like you too. And that's when I said, I don't care what you've been smoking. I don't care who you're sleeping with. I don't care who you are or what you've done. You run to Jesus the way Tom did. And he did night before last, or last week because I made sure. Run to him, and Jesus will love you. I want you to know, I was their hero. Those people love this old suit, three-piece, tie, preacher who'd come to the Banana River to do a memorial for a drunk. It was so, it was so good. we got to do that in church. That was church. And we loved each other. We loved each other because we weren't wearing masks. And so there's a 
realistic assessment of who we are. Then secondly, oh, let me tell you, I, I, let me tell you another story. I, I, uh, I got to get back to the propositions and the doctrine, but I just got to tell you this story. I was invited to, um, to speak for a place called Camp of the Woods, and I love those people. It's a conference center in upstate New York, and it's made up of the straightest, most obedient, most saintly Christians in America. They go up there every summer, and it's a beautiful place. They've got a hotel, and they have this conference room. You stay a week if you're a speaker. You only have to speak three times. And then they have concerts at night. But these are very, just the opposite from the people who were at the Banana River. And, uh, and so I'm just learning about grace. And, uh, and I'm sitting on a stool like this, and I'm teaching. It's this kind of auditorium. So when they have an altar call, they just put somebody in the aisle and give them a shove, and they roll down f uh, front. And, and they're all sitting there, all got their Bibles open. And I thought, I'm... Um, I was teaching something else, and I decided, I'm going to tell these people the truth. They'll probably kick me out, but shoot, I'm not very comfortable here anyway. <laughs> so I just closed my notes and put them on the pulpit, and I said, let me tell you some things that I'm dealing with. Can we talk? And I told them about my father and the suicide of my grandfather and the fact that my father didn't have a father, and that affected me, and how I went into bars, and, and how I always fell on the And I just went on and on and on, and I'm thinking, oh, man, they're going to kill me. And I look out, and people are getting out their handkerchiefs, and they're wiping their eyes. And it was over. This guy came down, and, and I was standing down, what, what I always do, talking to people. And this guy that looked like Frankenstein is coming down the aisle in my direction. And I thought, oh, my, he's going to kill me. And, and, he, and he walks up to where I am and literally picks me off the floor. And he's weeping. And he said, oh, Steve, my father committed suicide. And I've never told anybody that before. And I turned around. This girl was next to me. She said, can we talk, Mr. Brown? I've been sexually abused. And I've never told anybody before. And all of a sudden, what had been a very uptight, straight kind of thing started getting real. It was the best week I had spent in a long, long time. Because there was a realistic assessment of who we really are. Are you scared? Oh, me too. You have a bad self-image? Oh, me too. You, you screw it up sometimes? Oh, me too. Now, can we talk? And can we be friends? And then, secondly, I want you to know that grace not only provides a realistic assessment of human nature, but it provides a benevolent manifestation of human compassion. Galatians 6, 1 through 2, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Now, for those of you who are Reformed, who understand the Reformation, you're aware that Reformation teaching is that one of the signs of the church is church discipline, the signs of the true church. And just so you know, I believe that. I don't like the way we do it, but I believe it. I believe that discipline is never for sin. It's always for a lack of repentance. If it were for sin, nobody would be left except me. Uh, it's for a lack of repentance. And uh, one time my mother, and she was a Democrat and I'm a Republican, she is very, very strong, never manipulative. She's home with Jesus, straightening God out now. And she's, uh, she taught me how to cuss, and she read Spurgeon in the Bible every morning taught me how to cuss by mid-afternoon, and, and I owe her more, more than I can tell you. But we fought a lot. We fought about politics, and we fought, I mean, it's just, in fact, my wife used to get tickled when we were watching the Republican or the Democratic conventions together, and we had this rule. We couldn't say anything. So my wife gets tickled, and she said, all y'all do is hump. You go, hump, ha, 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 and it goes back and forth. Uh, uh, but, but between my uh, mother, but we were, we were watching television one night and she said uh, there was a woman who was suing a church because they publicly revealed her sin and it was going to go to court. Uh, and it publicly humiliated her. And my mother said, that's not right. And I said, mother, it's in the Bible. She said, oh no, it's not. 
And I said, oh, yes, it is. I'm a Bible teacher, and I know. She said, it's not. God's not that way. It's not in the Bible. I said, yes, it is. I'm ordained, and you're not, and I know. And she, and she said, well, show it to me. And I said, well, I don't know exactly, but I'll find it. So I went back to the room, and all night I'm looking for discipline passages in the Scripture. And it's there, but it's just a little... There are only one or two very small passages. And I got to think, and I hate telling my mother I'm wrong. I remember the next morning saying, all right, Mom, there, it's not there much, but it's there, okay? And, and, uh, and I got to thinking, why do we make such a big deal out of it if it's only there a little? Could it be our self-righteousness? Could it be the mask that we're wearing? The need that we have to be right? That if I can point my finger at somebody else, nobody will look at me? Why do we make such a big deal out of it if God doesn't make such a big deal out of it? Uh, let me read something to you because I want to say this exactly the way I wrote it. Compassion is the flower that grows out of the need of those who would show it. And the ancillary to that is when the flower of compassion doesn't grow out of personal need, it's not compassion, it's indifference with a spiritual mask. That's true, by the way. Paul knew it. If you're sure you're right, for God's sake, don't try to correct people who are wrong. If you're sure that you're pure, please, for God's sake, don't correct people who aren't good. Because you see, it takes a drunk to help a drunk. It takes a sinner to help a sinner. You can't show compassion except from a wounded heart. And if you don't have the wounded heart, intimacy, we can't love each other, will never take place. I had, a, I had a girl, and I'm going to get to it, but I, I remember she came into my office. She was the most perfect church member I ever had. She was at the church every time the doors opened. She taught a Sunday school class. She taught a Bible study. Uh, she was perfect. She understood doctrine. She could repeat the Westminster Confession of Faith backwards, but she was single and not married, and she, stood, she came into my office to talk to me about it, and she said, I do not understand why I'm not married, and I said, Sarah, that's not her name, I said, Sarah, God loves you, and she said, well, he doesn't show it, and I said, but he does love you, and she, and she didn't say it, but you could see it in her eyes, well, of course he does, I've done everything he said for me to do, she said, I'm out of here, and she got up and walked out of my, and she left the church. Uh, she was gone for seven months, and she did some, I mean, all the stuff she'd been good about. She balanced it out with bad, I mean, she did, she slept with her boss, she got drunk, she partied, and then she called up and asked if she could come and talk to me. And she sat across from me, and she just wept. And I said, Sarah, God loves you. And she said, how could he love me? I said, he does, and that was the first time that she began to uh, understand. All right, thirdly, grace not only provides a realistic assessment of human nature, a benevolent manifestation of human compassion. And by the way, Sarah became the most compassionate person in our church, and before she had been the most condemning person in our church. And then thirdly, it also provides a pragmatic evaluation of personal adequacy. Galatians 6, 3. Uh, For if anyone thinks that he is something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Do you have, uh, do you have uh, celebrities where you worship at their altars? You know, somebody who's really teaches good, who's real. Let me tell you something. If you meet a super Christian, Somebody lied to you, and you demean yourself. Now, if, if you say I said this, I'll say you lied. But I saw Billy Graham bite his fingernails one time. I really did. And I've been around Mr. Graham. Uh, one time uh, when his mother was dying, and Grady Wilson told me this story. 
Grady said that uh, w when his mother was dying, she would slip out of a coma, uh, and they would sing hymns and read scripture, and then she slipped back into the coma, and the family was all around the deathbed. And one time, she came out of the coma and had a horrified look on her face, and then she slipped back into a coma. And Grady said that for weeks, Mr. Graham thought she'd gone before the throne, and God had told her her son Billy's sins. That is so cool. He is so childlike, and he's so authentic, and he's, but I've watched him. So if you're worshiping at Billy Graham's altar, stop it. He bites his fingernails, okay? Charles Spurgeon was, do you know he was bipolar? You say, oh, no. He was the prince of expositors, the greatest teacher of the Bible in the last 300 years. No, he was bipolar. He'd go through periods of depression and couldn't preach for months. You say, wait, don't tell me this. Why are you saying this to me? Because it's very important that if you have biographies in your library of super Christians and they don't tell you about their humanness, burn them. We've got to stop this. We've got to be honest with each other, and that's the gift of grace, a realistic assessment uh, of personal adequacy. One time D.L. Moody got a review when he was in England for his first crusade. I guess you don't say crusade anymore. His first time in England. And a newspaper reporter said, there is nothing to explain Dr. Moody. He has a high whiny voice. He's grossly overweight and he butchers the English language. And Moody read it and said, he's got it. He's got it. It's Jesus, folks. No, there are no super Christians. Fourthly, grace provides a realistic assessment of human nature, a benevolent manifestation of human compassion, pragmatic evaluation of personal adequacy. It provides an explicit call for Christian vulnerability. Uh, well, we've, we've talked. Uh, he says, share one. You can't share unless you bear. I have a friend, Bruce Thielman, who died when he was pretty young, big old six foot five preacher, was the chaplain at Grove City College. He's a bachelor, he'd been a bachelor all of his life, and he used to be at Glendale, California at a Presbyterian church there. And he traveled around the world, and sometimes he told me one time, he said, it's really, really lonely. I don't have a wife, and I don't have children, and I don't have a lot of close friends. And, and, and he came back one time, and a, and a storm had almost destroyed his church, and he was just suicidal. So he started calling preachers in Glendale, and he said, would you have lunch with me? And they'd say, oh, Bruce, I don't think I can do it. I, I've, got, I've got appointments for the next two weeks, and he called another one until he got, went through his whole list. And he finally got to the last preacher on his list, and, and he said, can we have lunch tomorrow? And the guy said, Bruce, I don't think, and Bruce said, I'm not taking that. You're my brother. I've got to talk to you, and I've got to talk to you tomorrow. And so the guy said, all right, we'll meet. So they met at a restaurant, and, and uh, they were sitting in this fancy restaurant in Glendale, and Bruce said, I'm so lonely. I'm, I'm just about to die, and I had to have a friend. And the other preacher said, Bruce, let me tell you why I didn't want to have lunch with you. The night before you called, I came in and found my wife in the arms of another man. And Bruce said, you should have been there. Said two old preachers holding hands and crying together in the middle of a fancy restaurant. Uh, vulnerability is very important because I can't help you if I think you're together. And you can't help me if you think I'm together. And grace provides that. And then there's a final thing, very quickly. Uh, grace provides a clear mandate for individual responsibility. Uh, you hear about the man that was going across India on a train, and he had everything he owned in a suitcase, and he put the suitcase in the rack above his, his, uh, his seat, and he knew he was going to have to stay awake all night because there were thieves on the train, and he watched that suitcase very, very carefully. And uh, in 3 o'clock in the morning, he just couldn't keep his eyes open, and he just drifted off for a second. When he opened his eyes, the suitcase is gone. And he went, thank God. Now I can go to sleep. <laughs> That's what happened to me. I had it all in my suitcase. It was all there. Now I can say, it's me, oh Lord. It's me. It's not my brother or my sister. 
It's me. I'm a sinner. I've got to repent. I've got to walk with you. I've got to be honest with you. I've got to be off. And you've got to be that way with me. Because that's the only revival. And you may not like me. But Jesus isn't going to come until you love me. And frankly, I don't like you that much. <laughs> but until I love you, Jesus isn't going to come. Because that's the way he does revival. So let him take the suitcase. It wasn't worth anything anyway. You don't have to pretend to be good anymore. You announced to the world when you joined the church you weren't. You don't have to be right. I have this dream that when we all die and we go to heaven, God's going to stand in front of all the gathered Christians of all the generations, and God's going to say, I have some good news and some bad news for you. And somebody way in the back is going to say, tell us the bad news first. That would be a Presbyterian. And, God, and God's going to say, the bad news is you all got it wrong. And some of you got it really wrong. But the good news is I've talked to my son about you, and he says you're okay. So welcome home. You don't have to be right. In fact, over these evenings of grace, 50% of what I told you is wrong. I just don't know which 50%. <laughs> I don't have to be right. I don't have to pretend to be good. I don't have to be your mother. Now, can we be friends? You think about that. I'm in.